Hello, everybody. I think we're live. Uh, let's hope we're live. I'm always a little bit uncertain. I have to check um, against what's actually happening here on Facebook. Yes, I think we are live. Got some people joining us. Hold on. Um, yes, I'll just give everybody a little moment uh, to come on board. Great, everything's working. I like that. Um, and then I'll do the introductions and we can Again, make a start. What's actually happening here oh, on Facebook? On. Yes, I think we're hearing myself in the background. Uh, okay, yes, we've got people joining us. Excellent. So um, I'm just going to put a little something in the comments before we make a start. Um, whilst everybody's coming along, I'm just going to say, uh, please add your questions to the comments. Um, Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our second uh, an interview with Wise Oceans uh, here live on Facebook, complementing our many written interviews we have on our website. My name is Charlotte. I think um, quite a few of you have probably met me before. I'm often here on Facebook. And um, today, we're very, very excited to have Professor Louise Alcock here to talk to to us all and to answer your questions and to talk about her career, to share her advice and um, hopefully inspire others to um, make the move into a career in marine science of, of some kind or uh, perhaps uh, persuade you to take the plunge and go for it or give you some advice to help you make that next step in your career. So hello Louise. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming today and um, uh, I'm really, really grateful that you could make the time. I know you're very busy, uh, but we know that lots of our audience are going to really enjoy hearing what you've got to say. Um, I've got a few set questions, but as you know, it's pretty flexible and we, we may go off on tangents. <laughs> it's entirely possible. Um, so I'm just going to start um, by just uh, getting getting you to tell people a little bit about yourself, um, what you currently do, maybe the route you got to to get there. So to give a little context about where where who you are, where you're at. Okay. Well, um, I'm currently professor of zoology and head of the zoology department at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, so I'm on the west coast of Ireland, on the Atlantic coast, which is a lovely place to, to be a marine place. biologist, obviously. Um, how did I get here? It's really convoluted, actually, because um, I didn't set off to be a marine scientist for a start. I set off to be a vet, and I went to veterinary college in Camden Town, at the Royal Veterinary College, and I found it really boring. <laughs> 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 a thing to say. Um, yeah. and, and, and so I left, and, and a friend of mine had gone to do marine biology and was really enjoying it. And so I thought, oh, I'll go and do that then. <laughs> it's as good a reason as any. I love that. <laughs> so um, slightly random, um, but I did. I went up to Liverpool University and I, I joined in the marine biology degree, actually actually into the second year because they gave me a bit of credit for the basic science and things that I'd done at the start of a veterinary degree. And um, I loved it. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. I spent my... Used to, they used to have a field station out in the Isle of Man and you spent your final year of your degree out in the Isle of Man at the field station and that was lovely because you really sort of got immersed in marine science then. They always had really good degree marks because I think everyone got sucked in and there wasn't much else to do there in the winter and things so everybody worked really hard and, and got excited by the PhD students we were surrounded by and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah I finished my PhD and, and um, I started applying for jobs. I got a job, my first job I applied for several. I didn't. I didn't get the first one. I, I really wanted the first one. It was working at NOC in Southampton. I didn't get one, and I got one at, um, instead at the National Museums of Scotland as curator of mollusks, which was awesome because I'd done my PhD on octopuses and mollusks were my thing. Curator so I went of mollusks. Yeah, one of the greatest. So I went there for. <laughs> yeah, I we went there for a few years. Edinburgh was great, but um, my husband failed to get a job there. He wasn't my husband at that point, but he was clearly going to become my husband. <laughs> Um, and he couldn't get a job there. So I, I actually moved then. He managed to get a job in 
Queens in Belfast in Northern Ireland at the university. It's always a nightmare having trying to have two careers in the same place because you're always chasing academic jobs in the same university. So I, I, I followed him to Queens. I managed to get a job at Queens that when he'd got after he'd got a job at Queens. So I worked um, as a marine biologist there as, as, as an academic for a few years. And then he moved down to Galway here. He got a job as professor here. Um, and at that point, I had small babies and, and that was a bit tough because you had to think about, do you give up your career or what do you do or how do you do it? Or do you keep your job up north while someone else is working down south? And, and in the end, I, I sort of <laughs> And I, I handed in my notice and I moved and, and it, it took me quite a few years to get another job and to get a job at the university here. And for a while I thought I'd sort of blown it. Um, and then I got another job and then it was fine. And 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 before I knew it, I was suddenly head of department, which is like <laughs> I know that feeling. Absolutely <laughs> awful job. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, here I here I am. I'm not allowed to say that, am I? <laughs> Anyone who's been head of department knows that, you know. And, and Pretty much we, didn't go, we didn't study to be marine biologists so that we could be head of department. No, we, there are many good things, but there are some challenges for sure, <laughs> I would say. Um, that's really, I mean, going back to changing your career, uh, changing your degree, I think that's really important to, we, um, having also previously been in academia, not at all in marine science, um, uh, the, the idea that, you know, you, if you, end up on a degree that you don't like, it's not the end of the world. And you, you can, you know, there's, you can change, you know, there are things to think about, but lots of people make a full start and try something else. And then turns out it was the thing they should have done all along. Yeah, I, th I think you, you have a limited experience of what jobs are out there at the time you're make, you've been asked to make these decisions about, firstly, about what A-levels or yeah. Or whatever your higher level um, exams are, even deciding those subjects is is quite tricky. And 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 then you're being asked to choose a job when you've got a really limited experience of the job world. So I think like making false starts is is just one of those things that happens to quite Don't a lot. Don't worry of about it. Yeah. No, exactly. You you've got years to find the right path. So so um, yeah, just just change. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's better to finish what you're doing because you're close enough to getting a degree and a degree can be something. Yeah. You can finish the degree and then go and do a master's in something else or go and get some experience in somewhere else. So it's not always give up. Sometimes no. you give up. Sometimes, sometimes you're just like, you don't want to finish that course. Yeah. Work. But <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh. Sometimes it can just, you know, you can see that thing through to get that little tick which enables you to take a step up to move on to something else. So you've got to have a little yeah. bit of, um, smartness about it I think yeah good really good advice yeah very much so um so uh so that's kind of uh where you are now I, I know for a fact that you've spent um a lot of time out in the field studying particularly uh cephalopods mollusks and and so on so I wonder if you could just tell people a little bit about the the sorts of things that you are interested in in, in, in your research yeah, so I, I, well, I always had a thing for octopuses. I, I mean, for a long time, and I think like most of people's interests when they start, probably quite a lot comes from natural history programs because that is where you've seen all these fascinating creatures. Yeah. And I think that was that was definitely the case for me with octopuses. I had no reason for wanting to work on octopuses, but I did. Um, and so I, I I tried to pursue a PhD in octopuses, and I, I talked to a few people who could possibly make this happen. And and while I was sort of trying to make this happen, because you have to write for funding and, and you know, make numerous applications and, and kind of, it takes time to pull these things off. Um, one of the people I was, I was um, discussing opportunities with, who is now retired, but was an enormous support during the early part of my career, worked at British Antarctic Survey. And he, he had a team looking at uh, juvenile cephalopods around the Falkland Islands, because there's a fishery there. Um. I mean, he, he had uh, a research, a research exposition going down there for I have come over six or eight weeks around the Falkland Islands on a on a vessel and asked me if he wanted to go and I think he paid me something like the princely sum of a hundred pounds a week um, to go which I thought was amazing just out of my degree um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, don't know, my, I just I remember my parents sort of looking at me you're going on a fishing vessel in the South Atlantic so sort of like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't it great <laughs> <laughs> so I was, 
<laughs> like for the first 48 hours I was sick as a dog I mean you 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 can't imagine you think you've been on ferries and you've been sailing maybe in small boats and you think you know what the motion of a vessel is like but but you know vessels big vessels have motions all of their own and uh so I <laughs> after the first 48 hours though everything passed and it was fine and 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 I seemed a little bit better and after that I, I just knew that whatever I did had to involve going to sea so so after that, when, when I did get my funding for my PhD, I made sure I spent a huge amount of time at sea. I used to blag my way on other people's vessels. Um, and I still advise all my students to do this now because people often have spare berths and, and they'll always take a willing PhD student who, who's going to, you know, do something productive. Yeah. Um, I blagged my way down to the Antarctic and I, I spent some time in the Weddell Sea and, and around the Antarctic Peninsula and, and, and after by that time it was happening I'd sort of everyone knew then that I had some sea legs and I would work hard and so then it became easier and easier to blag my way on research vessels yes. and, and I'm, I'm, I'm still doing that to this day to a certain extent. Um, I, think, um, but, I think that's really important. Um, uh, my previous career was in music which is also really competitive and kind of quite hard to find your way through sometimes and I used to say to the students that you know actually although it's competitive finding really smart lovely nice to get on with people who you want to spend time with who can do what they say they'll do actually they're not that they're not that many of them so if you're one of those people you know get in there because people always want good people don't they and people that they will, will like to be on a boat with and who can get the job done and yeah absolutely and, and boats are good I mean ships can be quite you know they, they're quite small especially if you're on a if you're a long way away I mean if you're just a few days offshore then you're not going to be out that long but some of these Antarctic trips you know we'd be gone for like eight weeks it's quite a long time to to spend on a small boat with everyone so you, you kind of have to be quite easy going yes. and, and and chill and not be too precious about your personal space because you're not going to have any you know, <laughs> <Exactly. it's cheap. laughs> yeah, and, even, and 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 quite a lot of um marine conservation ngos are sometimes also in, in like remote islands and um and remote places within those islands as well where you're just like you and, a, and four other people you know so yeah absolutely being able to just like you say just get on with it be be cool <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm old and senior now you know and I usually get my own cabin which is very nice but but you know I never did in the early days you're always sharing and and you know you really have no space whatsoever we've so, just had know, a question actually you've about got to have that. a certain sort of mindset to enjoy that absolutely yeah very much so. <laughs> yeah we've just had a question what's the longest time you spent on a boat No, I couldn't hear you then, Charlotte. Sorry, oh, I lost sorry. my signal. Uh, what, we just had a question that said, what's the longest time uh, you've spent on a boat? Oh, three months was the longest. I, I did a trip to the Antarctic. There was actually a mid-cruise break, um, but the mid-cruise... Oh, got a little... Oh, there we go. Little frozen thing going on there. For, is it just me? Let's just double check. Oh. Uh, yes, I think we've got. Uh, I think we've got a. I think you're frozen there, Louise. Hopefully, you'll come back. Let me just send you a little mess. Oh, technology. I'm sure Louise will be back in a moment. <laughs> um, uh, also, whilst Louise is coming back, I've just seen another question uh, from uh, MC Cajuns. And uh, said, so this is reassuring. I think she, uh, we were talking about uh, changing careers. So I've been a surgical technologist for five years, now looking for, some, yes, exactly. So um, yes, transferable skills are great. Ah, Louise is back with a background. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I think my internet was a bit dodgy. I had to leave my work computer in the kitchen because it's <laughs> dinner time in my house and there's children oh. to feed. And so I was, I was joining you from the front room and then I just lost all internet connection, but I realized dinner was open. So I closed my laptop as the connection broke and ran to the kitchen. And uh, now, I'm, now I'm back at my workstation. 
<laughs> less dodgy internet. Sorry about that, everybody. No, no, that's fine. Um, uh, I, yes, we were talking about what the, what the longest time you spent on a boat. Oh, yes, it was three months and, and, and it was in the Antarctic. Uh, it was on two cruises. They were called Andeep 1 and Andeep 2, and they were looking at the Antarctic deep sea. And um, there was a there was a mid cruise break, so lots of people changed over actually between the cruises, which was quite nice. But like the mid cruise day break was like twelve hours in Punta Arenas, which is like really, you know, it's the middle of nowhere <laughs> from the middle of nowhere. It's just a port at the end of the earth, really, at the tip of South America. So it's not exactly it wasn't exactly an exciting break, but there was some nice. It was nice to have people leave and people come because you had new faces. But yes. there were just a few of us who, who did the 12 weeks. And, and quite a lot of people had gone mad after the first six weeks, you know, and a few more go mad after the second six weeks. But I just love ships. I, I'm just settled down into, into ship life and I'm completely content. Um, all the, I love the ocean. So even if everyone's winding me up one day, which actually doesn't happen very often, I can always just go and sit on deck and stare at the sea because I just love it. So it's it's what you make of these things, isn't it? It's always finding a way to to make it work for you. Absolutely. Um, uh, I thought I might actually I've got a few photographs that you kindly shared. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to um, share my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, just put that um, just to, so people can see some of the exciting <laughs> things that you've been doing. Um, hold yes, on. Let's just go full full screen here. Hold on, my my computer's having. There we go. Yes, so there you are on a boat, looking comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that's me in the Indian Ocean uh, last year when I was out with Necton, and um, uh, oh, I, fabulous cruise. I mean, the Indian Ocean is tropical, so that's a warm tropical evening. Hence, we're all sitting in shorts and t-shirt, and uh, I look. I look a little bit bored, I think, but I'm probably just exhausted because this is about <laughs> this is about nine o'clock at night, and we are actually there's a little net off to the side there on the left, which you can't really see. You can see where the moonlight's shimmering on the water, and you that's yeah. just the edge of our net there, and we're doing a little plankton tow, surface plankton tow, and it's about nine o'clock at night because we were waiting for it to get dark because. Um, plan there's plankton movement with daylight and darkness and so we wanted what was in the surface waters at night but of course our days were starting at half six in the morning so Ooh. breakfast was at six I think and we, we had a we had a group meeting either half six or quarter to seven every morning and you know that group meeting you were supposed to be kitted up and ready to start work and, and we were straight out on the little rib then to pick up the drop camera so that's like 14 15 hours into a day's work so if I'm looking a bit <sighs> yes i'm probably feeling it but, but so along um, with the exciting aspects of going to the indian ocean and going into submarines and so on it's actually a lot of hard work as well <laughs> but the thing is ships are really expensive you know it costs a lot of money to get a ship down there and a crew and so you've got to use every amount of time that you've got and so sometimes you might work long days but i mean look at me it's like not like i'm doing manual labor is it i've got one <laughs> eye over my shoulder on you know it doesn't matter that i'm not operating machinery or doing something that that you know is, no. is a problem with 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 being a little bit worn out that day um so you know it's that's that's part of the course we often work shifts and we didn't on this cruise because it was mostly a daylight um daylight operations right. on some of my expeditions that i do in the north atlantic we we work 24 hours around so we just always work in shifts and yeah, of course like that getting into shift work and getting out of it again is, is hard work so there's always a few people wandering around with sort of needing matchsticks on their <laughs> eyes and things what else have we got here oh look that, that looks like a fun yes so this is the same expedition. This is me and Denise in front of the submersibles. This was right at the start of the cruise. And this was exciting to both of us because neither of us had been in a submersible before at this point. And we both have now. Um, and there's people, you know, fixing them and setting things up. And we were just really excited to have these two submersibles on, on a deck because like, I mean, it's, I, I work mostly with ROVs, which are remote vehicles, and the vehicle goes down, but you don't. It's tethered on a fiber optic cable to the ship, and you can see live footage. And you have camera feeds and things, but you're not actually down there. And I had never been in a submersible prior to this expedition, and it's just pretty much the coolest thing I've ever done, frankly. <laughs> I was going to ask, how was it? But I mean, the, the answer, I hope, is obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Everything you hoped it would be, fantastic. Oh, and here you are. 
yeah so yeah there i am um in a submersible not very deep i don't think there because you can tell by the light that's coming through yeah um, uh, i did but it, it was just super cool i mean it's fun, it's funny when you're in surface tropical waters because it's not very cold because the surface waters are quite warm and it was a bit like a sauna in in, in the start in shallow waters so i didn't i wasn't I, i'm not going to say i didn't like the shallow water dives because being in a submersible is awesome at any time yes not complaining i'm sure but the deep dives so i dived to 250 meters which is about the limit of these subs i think mm. and that was just awesome that was just totally amazing just surrounded any, by did blue you see anything interesting new or um what did you see what you thought you'd see I, yeah, I don't know what I thought I'd see, really, because we're in the Indian Ocean. I'd never worked in the Indian Ocean before. So I have some idea of, you know, what the mesophotic might be like and that we're going to get corals as we get deeper and, you know, particularly black corals. And, and so I had some idea of what the fauna might look like. But I think what I hadn't really thought about was the very large fish. So we saw quite a lot of sharks and things. And on one of these dives, I saw an ocean sunfish. Um, I probably do have the video. I mean, I, I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, uh, I might be... Yes, if I can make you co-host. I can, I can. Let's go. Um, this is, yeah, okay, this is I'll, a tiny little- I'll unshare my screen. There's a tiny little clip here. Let's see if I can share mine. Here we go. Because now I've moved back to my kitchen computer. You see, I've got everything. <laughs> <laughs> right here we go Ooh. now you probably don't get the sound i probably just get it in my ears so you won't get my excited commentary i'm actually oh, going he's goodness. coming to see us he's coming to see us this is so exciting look at that oh wow I mean, they, these things are two meters long this like came right up to my window amazing Oh, that's awesome. I have a friend who, who was on a coral dive, doing a, a survey. So typical coral dive, had their head down, looking at corals and everybody came up at the end and said, did you see the sunfish? And she was like, no, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I always joke that, that well, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me, I think, yeah. you know. It was That's just amazing because you've got because you're in this acrylic sphere you know so you've got like 360 vision it's just amazing fantastic blue planet in action <laughs> <laughs> okay oh that's fab fabulous um okay i better get back to my questions Fun yeah sorry <laughs> okay no that's great um so um one of the things we want to 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 do here is to, to sort of perhaps impart any advice and one question we have is are there any skills that you never thought you'd need, but you did, you know, things that, um, things that have helped you that perhaps you weren't necessarily on the curriculum or maybe they were. Yeah. Things that weren't on the curriculum. Um, I can, I can think of three. So, so bearing in mind, I'm, I'm a little bit older than people who are getting their degrees now. Um, I went to school in a reasonably sexist time and, um, the girls took typing, do you know, we did not envisage that we would all be working on computers 24 seven, but my God, I can type fast. Yeah. And I just look at the men around me and I just like, you know, they don't stand a chance. They're never gonna be able to write as much as me. So that is a skill that I didn't expect to be useful. Mm -hmm. um, I had this really old car. I had a Fiat 126 that I inherited off my sister that was always broken. So I was always fixing it and everyone was always laughing at me because I always had tools. I was always covered in oil and my car was always broken. But I tell you, as a marine scientist, those skills of being able to fix stuff are really, yeah. really important. Especially if you're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So so being able to mess with stuff like that is, is, is I think, really, really important. And, and the other skill I have, which is a really odd one, which again comes back to my age, is I was the last sort of cohort I think at school probably to, to suffer learning Latin and I learned a bit of Latin at school but of course species names and taxonomy and all that kind of stuff is so useful yeah. whoever thought Latin would be so useful because of course everybody hated it and everybody thought it was silly but who thought it would be so useful so those yeah. are some really odd um combination of things yeah, that I have exactly um and uh in terms of, I mean, we get a lot of queries from 
people. And in fact, we've got um, some questions here um, uh, about, you know, do you need to have to scuba dive to, to be a successful marine biologist? And um, uh, I would say no. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think it depends where you want to work, really. I mean, if you want to work on coral reefs, you probably need to be able to to dive. But I mean, you know, I grew up in UK waters, pretty cold and miserable. I did learn to dive and it's all dry suit diving. And back in the day, it was none of this, you know, you get nice woolly bears with these lightweight suits. Now there were these huge neoprene suits that you used to muscle around in looking like Michelin. It was horrible. And they had really tight wrist and neck seals because they were much thicker rubber. And that was the only way to sort of keep the water out. And you used to come up and like, everything that you cut the circulation off when your hands have been numb and you'd be trying to get your weight belt off with fingers that you couldn't oh. move and things and so I, I kind of retired from diving about 30 years ago yeah. so <laughs> and just, sometimes you do really you get to go in submarines now instead yes um, and I, I mean when I saw saw the guys you know diving when we were in the Seychelles on that expedition last year and there was some dive work going on in shallow water I was sort of oh I wish I'd kept that up sort of but it, it it has no purpose for my career I no. mean it would be a hobby because I, I work in much deeper waters than than diving depths I mean I consider sort of four six hundred meters shallow so <laughs> so that you know I'm, I'm never gonna need to dive for work so I think it totally depends on what you want to do interestingly when I was um doing my degree we had I remember um a lady called Joanna Jones, who, who had, had been a, a rocky shore ecologist, and she was retiring from the place where, where I was doing my degree. And she was talking about her career and she was saying she had dived, work dived her whole career, her whole career. And she was saying how much she'd grown to hate it because it was a work activity, you know, and it, it, you had to go whatever the weather, whatever, however you felt, all those tanks lugging around. And, and so actually sometimes it, it doesn't, you know what is a hobby doesn't turn out to be a work thing anyway so so i'd say dive if you love it and don't yeah. if you don't yeah i mean we i know we had a, a question from somebody who couldn't make it tonight we put, put a question in about um uh i think they're, they're studying fisheries at the moment i don't have the question in front of me but it, it was uh, they're studying fisheries they want to get into marine conservation marine science that way um and it is in your you know as moving sideways is that something that you've seen um a lot of people do yeah i think i think a lot of people do move sideways i mean probably depends how specific what you're studying is not how specific what you're studying is but but how much relevant other stuff is being excluded because it, broad knowledge is always good but if you've got broad knowledge about the ocean generally and trophic structures and habitats all of which presumably you need to be a fish specialist um then probably there's no bother to 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 move sideways and it's it's also if, if that's your degree it's always possible to go on and do a master's in a more specialist exactly. area um to, to to get more knowledge and, and sometimes you can learn on the job i mean a lot of what a lot of what i know has been discovered in the 30 years since i got my degree i read a lot i keep up to yeah. speed so you can learn a lot yourself actually by by you reading your being degree or phd it's almost out of date isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't make me feel older than you have to <laughs> sorry <I didn't>, you know. <laughs> uh we've got another question from heather which actually ties in with the question i was going to ask anyway and it says do you have any advice for people graduating with a marine biology degree on how to start their career or any advice you'd give your younger self which we sort of talked about just now but yeah um yeah, you know, what advice? Because it, it's it can seem an impenetrable degree because it's it can be competitive and and so on. And I can I do sympathise with um, recent. Yeah, efforts. if if you haven't yet graduated, I think get work experience wherever you can at all times, and do so. I mean, I I used to work on a sheep farm in my holidays. <laughs> Harks back to vet college days, of course, because it was really well paid and it paid off my student debt. But I'm sure it would have been a lot more use if I had done something relevant, but I didn't. Um, 
But if you can get relevant work in your holidays uh, or you can afford to, if you can afford to volunteer work, and I know not everybody can do that, but if you can afford to even spend a week or two volunteering, then it's really worthwhile. And it doesn't have to be somewhere beautiful and tropical and lovely. I know that some people go off and do coral keys and all this kind of stuff. Do you know, it can be it can be your local fish farm. It doesn't need to be sexy and lovely it needs to be work experience i think that's really really good advice you know um and also if you see yourself working in the uk or ireland then get i know we've had um this advice before get experience in the uk and ireland because it's yeah. more relevant than coral surveys in seychelles <laughs> That's right. And you can do other local things that prove on your CV that you're a doer. I mean, there's beach cleans all around the country all the time. You can organize beach cleans. You know, the Coast Watch organizes a, a lot of things. There are lots of there are lots of natural history and wildlife societies that you can get involved with wildlife trust activities and, you know, well and dolphin societies, these kinds of things. You can get in, involved locally. But what you need is more stuff on your CV than the person you're competing with. Yes. So, so um, I everybody think it, in your class is going to have the same degree. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, absolutely. So that's advice for if you haven't yet got a degree. If you've got a degree, I think um, apply for a lot of things, but don't send out these generic applications where you're sending the same CV to every single job. You know, you see, you each job should be accompanied each job application should be accompanied by a cover letter that says how you meet the essential criteria for the job to show that you've got the skills to do it you know tell them a little bit about you why you want that job and have a cv that you have made which highlights the skills that they are asking for to do the job so every application has to be individual but you need to do a lot of them because a lot of it's chance it's human yeah. beings who are reading the applications and each human being is excited by a different thing. So, so you, you know, you've got up your chances of exciting somebody who thinks, yeah, let's interview this person. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, we've got a few more questions coming in now. Excellent. Um, so we've got a question here from Madison who says during this time we're in having to quarantine here in the U S what's the best way to get experience when everything is closed All that, that is tough, isn't it? Yeah, I think that is tough and it depends where you are as well, because if you're in the middle of the country and you're not by the coast, it's really hard to to do any any work. However, um, you know, there may be people who want websites proofreading or or, you know, um, I don't know what sort of I mean, I do loads of admin all the time um, there may be things that you can that you can help with. So I, I would say you can still email and volunteer your services if you're on the coast we're back to you can do beach cleans and other things and there will be volunteer organizations i mean it it depends where you are and what the lockdown restrictions are in in your area i mean we've had a five kilometer one here for for the last six weeks and i'm quite lucky because i'm within five kilometers of the coast so i can go and walk on the beach but not everybody's that privileged no good um and then uh shivani has said I am doing a marine biology and coastal ecology degree right now. Would it be worth just contacting researchers slightly informally and ask if they need help? I'm not sure what my specific interests are yet. Yeah, I think so. I mean, one of the things we say to our marine science students here in Galway is that you could just contact the PhD students that are in your department. Mm. Would anybody like a hand in the lab? You know, and then you can fit it around your other studies and, and get knowledge of what's going on in the labs. And it adds something to your CV, but it also gives you a better idea of what you might like to do when you graduate. If you move around a few labs during your three years of degree, you know, you'll have a better idea about, about what makes you tick. And there's often, I mean, I'll, we have students sometimes dive with our dive team. You have to be a very high level of diver to work dive. Um, so there aren't many students who actually fit that criteria, but sometimes we get students with high enough qualifications to dive with the work dive team. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, and Anna has said, what advice would you have for getting back into marine sciences when you've had some time away? <laughs> yeah, well, I did that. Really, isn't it? <laughs> I did that. Um, I guess the thing is, 
you have to work really hard and sometimes you have to work for very little um, payback at first because you've got to get your foot in the door. Now, I'm not really in the business of advising people to do jobs for free because I don't think the economy should work like that. But there are times where you need stuff on your CV and you need to show people that you're still current and this kind of stuff. So um, I think I think work really, really hard. And if, if you are able to juggle your life so that you can do it so that you don't have to wait for someone to give you a job to be doing something, then do that. It's not always possible. I mean, I was trying to get back in with little babies. It's pretty difficult, but I would work late at night. I was at that level of career where you're starting to, where you're publishing a lot of papers. So I would, even though nobody was paying me, I was writing papers because I knew that scientific papers were what would get me my academic post back. Yes. And, and so that's what I was doing. And it's brutal actually. But you're, you're just competing with other people all the time. And, and you, I, it's really harsh to say, but you kind of have to try and do more than the next person. That turns academia into a bit of a rat race. Like it really is academia, I think, now, um, and which is not a good thing. So I, I hesitate to advise it. But on a personal level, how do you achieve it? I mean, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, really, really good advice. Honest advice. Brilliant. Okay, so we're already over time, as I knew we would be, but I'm going to finish up with just a couple of uh, couple of quick questions that we always ask our, um, our interviewers. And um, one is, what's your, and I think I might know the answer to this, but maybe not. What's your favourite marine creature and why? Well, it, it, it's definitely an octopus. And if I have to choose which octopus, I'll say Storatooth is Satensis, which is this really cool deep sea octopus. Um, if I'd have thought more carefully, I could have had a picture for of, of it for you and it's it's got a it's one of these finned octopuses so it's got little fins up here and like it's got a deep because... yeah it's got deep web like a skirt and so it, it's sort of in in that sort of bit of water column just above the bottom usually and it balloons its its web out to sort of float but it's got uh bioluminescent suckers as well so it's super cool there is nothing uncool about it it is the coolest octopus in the ocean excellent uh, I think we all need to do some googling now. Uh, uh, and um, I, again, maybe we had the answer to this, but maybe not. Um, what is your most unforgettable moment in the sea? Yeah, I, I, I think you've you've probably <laughs> had had it with the sunfish. Although, although once once long long time ago there was a fire in the engine room on a ship, and and going past shag rocks backwards without an engine was quite interesting that's in the middle of the south atlantic so that was kind of quite unforgettable too in a different sort of way so there's one yeah. bad and one good yeah, absolutely brilliant um what we have one final question from noor uh, it says thank you for all these answers um i was wondering as an academic how much of your time is spent in the field <laughs> yeah not enough is the answer but um I think that if I didn't work on ships, I would probably never get in the field. You know, if I was just going to the coast, tomorrow would never come. There would always be one more admin job, one more admin job, one more admin job. But like, I've got my cruise dates for next August. I'm going to Rockall and drop in an ROV in some nice deep water. And I know what those dates are and the planning is starting. It you know, it's, it has to happen. And so I try to get to see on a decent length expedition, by which I mean at least two or three weeks every year. And if I don't get my ocean fix, I'm a little bit grumpy. <laughs> so preferably I'd like to get a month a year. Yeah. Um, as I get older and I have less family commitments, I might like to up that to a little <laughs> bit more. When I did my PhD, I, I spent almost probably almost a year of my PhD at sea, not in one go, but I just kept running off to other cruises. I once sent my um, PhD supervisor a fax from Stanley in the Falkland Islands to tell him I was joining another ship and I wouldn't be home for another six weeks. Excellent. <laughs> oh, someone's got a request for the name of the octopus again, please. Oh, somebody's out. I think Amber has actually just texted in there. Storatuthis. Suratensis. S Y R T E N S I S. It didn't do Latin. <laughs> 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 um, brilliant. Uh, well, we may well get some more questions. We've got some thank yous coming in there as well. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Louise. It's just been brilliant. Your fantastic career and the advice, uh, you're just perfectly placed to give the advice to uh, our audience. Um, and uh, really great 
um, useful and honest advice. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> and uh, thank you to everybody who's come along to, to listen to us. We are planning more of these. Um, so keep an eye out on Facebook. Um, we'll be doing these roughly about once a month or so. So um, look out for some more. And um, <clears throat> so thank you very much. And I think we'll just say goodbye. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, 